Thank you for attending the Biden Clemency Crisis, part of the Understanding Drug Sentencing Symposium. Before we begin, we have just a few notes we'd like to share with you. Note that Q&A and auto-generated transcription have been enabled for this event. Additionally, this event is being recorded. The recording will be made available as soon as possible after the event. Thank you again for joining us. Mark? All right, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mark Osler. I'm professor of law here at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis. And we're gonna be talking about clemency in the Biden administration and how we got to the, the point where we are now. Um, you know, the, we came through the Obama administration where at the end there was um, real action on clemency into the Trump administration that was like driving in Minneapolis and that there's long periods of nothing happening when brief periods of chaos. Um, and now uh, entering the Biden administration, some people had great hope and there was advocacy for thousands of grants um, in the first hundred days, for example, all of which has gone unrealized. And as we currently have a backlog of cases that has risen over 16,000 petitions. Uh, we have a great panel to, to talk about this today and I'll uh, introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. Um, Rachel Barco is the uh, Vice Dean and Charles Seligman Professor of Law at NYU. Um, she is one of America's leading experts in these issues and perhaps um, America's most um, effective advocate from the academy in these, this field. Uh, her book, Prisoner of Politics, has gotten great reviews um, it, and it's had an impact on, on the discussion generally. For example, um, Professor Barco is one of the, an early and fierce advocate for diversifying the federal bench to include people with a defense background instead of just former federal prosecutors, an idea that even as a former federal prosecutor, I think is a, is a good one. And we've seen that happening within the Biden administration. Uh, after Rachel, we'll be hearing from Jason Hernandez. And uh, Jason is uh, a person who was uh, convicted of a nonviolent drug offense. He was a first time offender. He received a life sentence. And uh, he served 17 years of his sentence before he was released in 2013 by President Obama by commutation. And one of the things that's remarkable about Jason um, is that he wrote himself out, uh, that he wrote his own petition. And after he was successful in that, he has made it one of his missions to help other people do the same thing. Um, Jason has written a great book called Clemency Now that's directed at people who are seeking clemency. Um, and it's a practical guide to what to do and what not to do. And it's really been remarkable. I've, I, I've given it to a lot of people um, so far. Jason also, um, since his release, has been incredibly active in his community uh, of McKinney in Texas. Uh, just a, the, the list of things that he's done within that home community um, is, is truly remarkable. And we also are going to be hearing from uh, Premal Daria, who is the executive director of the Institute to End Mass Incarceration at Harvard Law School. And uh, she has a long um, career of experience in this field. She was a uh, public defender in three different places, including uh, in Guantanamo. Um, and the institute that she's, she's hanging up now uh, is really off to a great start. Um, they have a publication called Inquest that's had a number of, of fascinating pieces already, and they're embarking on what can be really a, a central project in the broader um, uh, ecosphere of people who are working on these issues. Um, but we're going to start with Professor Barco. Thanks, Mark, um, and uh, thanks to everyone for allowing me to be part of this. Um, before I give you kind of an overview of where we're at in terms of clemency today, I just wanted to give a few pieces of background information. Um, so I wanted to just start by explaining why clemency is so important, particularly at the federal level. 
So I think probably most of the people who are listening are aware that we have a mass incarceration problem uh, in the United States um, with you know more than 2.2 million people incarcerated, um, and the federal prison system is among the largest. Uh, you know we currently have uh, almost 156,000 people who are currently incarcerated. Uh, in federal prisons. Um, more than half of them are there for drug crimes um, and they're serving really long sentences. Uh, life sentences, sentences like the one that Jason uh, received are just not uncommon. And in the federal system, there's really no way to correct those excessively long sentences other than through clemency. Uh, parole was abolished in 1987, so that is not a viable option. Uh, there's a mechanism for getting compassionate release um, up until very recently that was completely foreclosed unless the Bureau of Prisons filed a motion on your behalf. And even now uh, with people having some ability to file their motions directly with courts, uh, um, we're seeing really mixed reactions to petitions where the claim is that compassionate release should be based on the fact that a sentence is excessively long. We have some courts in the country are in circuits that have said you cannot make that claim. There's no grounds for it. Um, and even in geographic locations where you can make it, um, really mixed reactions by judges. So clemency remains the only national mechanism for correcting these excessively long sentences for this enormous federal prison population. Um, the other reason that clemency is so important at the federal level uh, are for people who are seeking pardons. So this is for the group of people who are out, but they want to get their record cleared. Um, and they often want to get their record cleared for very significant reasons, like, for example, they're facing deportation. Uh, and unless they can get the pardon, um, they're going to be removed from the country. Uh, so the stakes are very high. There's no other mechanism for those folks either. We don't have a federal expungement or way to get um, those collateral consequences removed. So clemency, you know, for better, for worse, when we're talking about federal options is actually critically important. Um, and for most of the nation's history, um, we had presidents who seemed to understand uh, that this was something they needed to do as part of their, their function. So I, I wanted to just give you a sense historically um, of what those rates look like. Um, so you can see we had presidents as recently um, as uh, presidents Carter and Ford, Nixon, Johnson, Kennedy, um, granting you know between a third and a fifth of the petitions that they received. Um, so pretty high grant rates. Um, and we start to just see the decline occur with the presidency of Ronald Reagan. And what's particularly interesting and I would say tragic about the fact that that's when the decline comes is that's really when the numbers should have gotten larger, not smaller, um, because parole was abolished in 1987, which means before President Reagan, these other presidents knew there was functioning parole and they still had fairly high clemency grant rates, even with functioning parole as a, another option for people seeking relief of their sentences. So if anything, we would have expected or hoped to have seen an increase in grant rates um, when parole was abolished, because that would have meant commutations would take on even added importance at that point. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it's just the opposite. Um, now, I, I want to highlight uh, another aspect of this, which is for those of you who follow clemency, you might have been aware of the fact that President Obama had a much touted clemency program, um, uh, sometimes known as uh, CP14, which was named after uh, the year it started uh, in 2014, a clemency project that began then. Um, and he had very much stated his concern with criminal justice issues. Uh, he wrote a law review article about how committed he was to various aspects of criminal law reform. And clemency was part of that. Um, now, despite um, the fact that he did show renewed interest in this, so first of all, I'm just going to remind everybody, his overall uh, grant rate ends up being pretty close to what President Clinton did, um, just a little bit better than, than President Clinton's uh, grant rate. Uh, but his commutation rate is, is certainly uh, better than the most recent presidents who came before him. Um, you know, starts to look a little bit more uh, like Nixon's, um, which again, you can decide for yourself how impressed you are by the fact that he, he rose to the level of, of Nixon. Um, but I want to highlight what we might have expected from a president who said he was very interested in granting clemency. 
So by making the announcement that he was very interested in this, um, you could probably imagine uh, the Department of Justice, because the president was interested in this, sent a message to everybody who was incarcerated. Um, and the result was a lot of people who were incarcerated <laughs> were very interested. <laughs> so um, they received over 33,000 petitions. Um, and this is going to be important because it's going to get us to that backlog that Mark had mentioned. Um, the Department of Justice was just not equipped to handle the deluge of petitions that came in. Um, the Obama administration quickly looked to outsiders to help. Um, they had hoped the federal defenders could kind of be the frontline actors to help with all of this, um, but unfortunately, uh, there were legal limits to the federal defenders' ability to do that. Um, and so instead, it was a group of essentially NGOs, non-governmental organizations uh, who helped screen the petitions. That's the group that came to be known as CP14. Um, and they, uh, they, they did their best. Um, you know, there were about 4,000 volunteers. Um, unfortunately, most of them did not have any experience with federal sentencing, with federal clemency. Um, and one of the criteria that President Obama had indicated was of concern to him is he was interested in giving clemency to people who wouldn't have gotten that same sentence today. Um, so being able to do federal sentencing calculations and explain why it wouldn't have been given today was actually really important, as well as other things that make a good clemency petition. I don't think uh, Jason's book was out yet at the time that they were filing this because they really could have used it. Uh, they were in over their head, I guess is what I'm going to say. Um, after one year of being in operation, CP14 managed to submit only 50 petitions up at that up until that point. Um, by the end, they did get in more than a thousand, um, but that's actually a pretty low rate when we're talking about a volunteer force of 4,000. And just to give you a basis of comparison, Mark and I set up a little clemency shop um, where we got some uh, some foundation funds to be able to pay some lawyers to do this full time. Um, so we had seven, I believe, full time attorneys doing this. Um, and the seven of them submitted more than 200 petitions uh, and got 96 of them granted. So I mentioned that just so we keep in our mind that this is something that is good to have people who specialize. It's good to have people who know what they're doing. Um, and you can't kind of just do this on the fly uh, and hope it's going to turn out to be OK. Um, for the Obama uh, end results, so of these 33,000 that they received, they were only able to review um, uh, about half of those. Um, they still had thousands that had no answer, um, and they ultimately granted uh, 1,716. Um, not all of the 1,716 were part of CP14, though. Um, there were 10 that were granted before the initiative was ever announced, um, so they're likely not part of that. They had some um, prisoner trade clemencies that I don't think are included in this, some military court folks like uh, we had Chelsea Manning. So there were a few that aren't, but it's ballpark about 1,700 um, through this initiative. Um, and you know, to his credit, the kinds of people who were receiving these grants uh, were much more racially diverse than we've seen in clemency statistics in the past. Um, 70% of the people who received clemency were black, 9% um, Hispanic. So the numbers looked more like what the federal prison population itself looks like. Um, and so for that, uh, I think, you know, there should be some credit given to the fact that it wasn't what we'd seen previously. Um, on the other hand, the folks that got the grant um, didn't seem to meet all of the things that the Obama administration said they were looking for. Um, they had said they were looking for people that didn't have significant criminal history, um, and they they had a variety of uh, criteria like no violence in their background. And when you looked at some of the grants, it didn't seem like they really were within the heartland of what those requirements were, although I think they were all deserving. Um, I think the requirements themselves were too limiting. Um, but even more disturbing is that a lot of people who did meet the requirements never got a grant. They, they were left in limbo. A few uh, were denied. Um, and it's the denials that I think you really need to focus on here. Um, because although I know the Obama administration wanted to focus us on uh, the number of grants, that is a record high level of denials. Um, and I do not think that it's proportionate to the merits. Um, there were people denied who should not have been denied. Um, 
so I want to highlight a couple flaws with this process because I think it's the kind of key lessons learned that I'm hoping uh, someday <laughs> we'll have a president who will really take to heart the lessons learned. Um, so the first one is uh, just the layers of bureaucracy in the Department of Justice, how cumbersome the process is, how ill-equipped it is to handle large numbers of petitions. All right, that's important because we have a current backlog of 16,000. So if you wanna be able to get through that backlog, you need a different process in place than this one because we have now seen through successive administrations, this does not process that many applications. You cannot get it done. You couldn't even get it done with outside help. Um, it is just not feasible, it is not possible. Um, so we have a process failure of really epic proportions. Um, the second is that these the denials that you see here um, with this kind of a of a process. Why are so many denies? Why so few grants? Um, I can tell you from having familiarity with the petitions that were filed by that group of lawyers that we worked with. Um, there were lots more meritorious petitions in there, lots more. Um, I would say thousands of grants that should have been given that weren't. Um, and that's another problem that I just wanna flag, uh, which is that I think having prosecutors in control of this whole process is the reason you see the number of denials that you do, including of people who seem to meet the president's own stated criteria. Um, the problem is this process starts with the Department of Justice going to the prosecutor's office that brought the case initially and saying, hey, what do you think about this case? And it's pretty unsurprising that the same people who brought it and fought for it say, well, we think we did a good job. Why do you want to take another look at that? And so they say no. Um, and that's the end of the matter for way too many of these petitions. Um, so I think what you see here is the result of um, an epic process failure um, and a huge conflict of interest in having the very same people who brought these cases in the first place asked to take a second look at what they did. Um, you're just going to get that kind of denial, and you're also going to get cases that are just never processed in the first place. Um, and you're going to be left with this was the current total as of at least yesterday when I made my slide, um, the number of pending petitions that we have. Um, now, I think this is a national embarrassment. Um, there are human beings behind every single one of these petitions. I know some of those people. I'm sure you do too. Um, they have been waiting, some of them, um, since 2016, since 2015, that they have been waiting for years um, with no indication about what's happening. They are waiting, they're worried, they're worried they're gonna be deported if they're waiting for a pardon. Um, they're serving excessively long sentences and wondering if they're ever gonna get out. Um, these are real human beings uh, behind these numbers. Um, and yet, uh, the Biden administration has shown no indication of doing something to meet this crisis. It's it's business as usual, uh, as far as they're concerned. Um, and, and I can't understand that, I, I really can't. Um, so if I leave you with one thought today, it's that that is unacceptable. Um, you, you can't leave 16,000 people uh, waiting in an endless queue um, who deserve their opportunity to be heard, who have real viable claims. Um, I think the answer to this is that you need a different structure in place to address these. I think it's the too many layers of bureaucracy and a bureaucracy that's in charge. Uh, it's prosecutors who are in charge of it. And there's an inherent conflict of interest asking them to do that. Um, and so I know we'll have a little time later to talk more specifically about the kinds of things we would put in its place. But if I leave you with one thought, uh, it's that we are a clemency system in absolute crisis. Um, and you know, nine some months into this administration, there there's no sign that they understand the magnitude of the problem. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Uh, and that is a very efficient PowerPoint. Um, now, one thing I want to note, too, is for those people who have questions, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A button. And you can, you can hit that and, and write your question in, and we'll be looking those over. Um, now, Professor Barco mentioned that there were 10 or so people who received clemency before this uh, big initiative really kicked off under President Obama. One of those people was Jason Hernandez, who we'll hear from next. Jason. Uh, hello, Mark. Uh, just, uh, I think first, just an honor to be on the panel with with two individuals, uh, Rachel Barkow and Mark Osler, uh, people that I used to read uh, court decisions from that the judge would actually quote uh, some of the materials that y'all would write and to actually come out of prison and 
to meet y'all than to be on a panel with y'all. It's just really, really cool, uh, amazing, surreal feeling. Uh, but so after now I'm done uh, highlighting y'all, <laughs> I'm gonna uh, t talk a little, talk a little bit about myself and my my experience with clemency inside and outside of prison. So. Uh, for, you know, first off, my name is Jason Hernandez. I am one of the first individuals to receive clemency in 2013 from President Barack Obama. On that day, uh, President Obama commuted the sentences of eight people. Seven were black, one was Latino, myself. Six were men and two, two were ladies. All of us were crack cocaine offenders. Six were serving life without parole and one was serving a 30 year sentence. Uh, this, even though we were the first group known as the Obama Eight, this was an act of mercy that was foretelling of what Obama's clemency initiative, initiative was about to come and what it was gonna focus on. Uh, but even after I received my commutation of sentence in 2013, I ended up staying uh, incarcerated for an additional 18 months. Uh, my life without parole sentence plus 320 years was knocked down to 20 years. And I had to do nearly uh, 17, I think I had to do 17 years, eight months on that. So I only had 16 years at the time that I received clemency. Uh, during that time, when I was incarcerated is when President Obama uh, announced his uh, clemency initiative. And during that, and that's when I, uh, that's when, when, when I was in there. So I was able to kind of get this, what you could say, this inside depth about what was going on in there. And from what prison officials were telling us based on information and records they had, the, they were estimating around 10,000 prisoners would be released. That was what the word was while we were incarcerated. What the staff was telling us, you know, ultimately uh, Obama's clemency initiative, when it was all said and done, resulted in over 1,700 people being granted release, all of whom were, were, all, were all drug offenders. Now, as Rachel mentioned earlier, uh, this is monumental on several accounts, but none more so than the fact that over 500 lifers received clemency. Uh, prior to that, if I'm not mistaken, there was only there's all, there's only been one prisoner who's re received clemency that was serving life without parole in the United States, and that was in the uh, the, the Bush administration, Bush two administration, where a person was ser serving life without parole for a methamphetamine offense. And what was also extraordinary and unprecedented was 80 percent who received clemency, as Rachel noted as well, were my minorities, over 80 percent. Prior to this. Black and Latinos who make up a majority of the federal prison system were least likely to receive clemency. Uh, nevertheless, despite how extraordinary uh, and monumental Obama's clemency initiative was, the nearly 1,700 prisoners who received clemency, me being one of them, was a far cry from the nearly estimated 10,000 people who were expected to receive clemency based on the Bureau of Prisons uh, information, what they were telling us. Now, there were previous administrations who have exercised this extraordinary executive power to grant, to grant clemency, uh, almost, I guess you could say, on, on a large scale. Uh, President Lincoln and President Andrew used mass pardons for war-related offenses committed by uh, federal, federal, uh, Confederate soldiers. In 1921, uh, President Hardin issued blanket pardons to anyone convicted under the Espionage Act. And to help to end the Vietnam War, President Jimmy Carter offered, offered blanket pardons to any American who, who had dodged the draft dur during that war. As is noted, as noted with all of these prior clemency initiatives, uh, most of these clemencies given by these presidents were in relationship to a war, which is also relevant today with drug offenders in federal prison and why a large number of these prisoners should receive clemency. Uh, since the 1960s, the United States has had a war against drugs, uh, a war that has resulted in communities being disrupted and some even destroyed. And when I say destroyed, there is no exaggeration to that statement. You know, to give an example, uh, and Mark can, and this was when I went to go visit Mark Oster one day, uh, one time, that certain parts of Detroit look like an actual atomic bomb has been dropped on. And other neighborhoods that were decimated were ultimately, ultimately that look like this across the United States have, uh, there's, they don't look like that no more because now they're, they've been completely flattened and now they have high rises, dog parks and cafes, which is known as gentrification. Uh, majority of all these communities uh, at, one at one time, which were minority driven or there's no minorities there or there's, there's a small amount of them. And I know that when I talk, you know, labels are extremely important. And I know that there is a lot of focus on words and humanization of people that are incarcerated. 
and you know we should not refer to them as convicts or prisoners. But I believe to refer to these individuals, uh, anything other than prisoners, uh, would not be reality and would be down, downplaying the circumstances that these individuals uh, are in. Uh, and what I mean by that is that anytime a person is kept in prison for an excessive amount of time that is not justified by their conduct or their crime is in true context a prisoner and his or her sentence becomes something more than a punishment. And I think it becomes something more to uh, a torture uh, to, to an extent, to keep a person in prison for a period of time that they don't look, that they, they shouldn't be there. Uh, so when we think about clemency, we think about redemption in relationship to the prisoners, like somebody like myself who was incarcerated. But because of the war on, because of the way the war on drugs was implemented and the way it was enforced, which I would say resulted in the medicine being worse than the disease is actual, than, than the actual disease. Clemency is a first step and one of the many steps for the United States to acknowledge that they made a mistake. That they didn't know better and through time and experience have learned that what might have seemed right when these laws were passed, that through time and experience have learned you know, what might have seemed right then uh, is, is, not, is not right now. And through clemency is not only a way for a prisoner uh, to be redeemed, but in a manner in which the United States, I believe, can ask for forgiveness, for mercy, and to redeem themselves. Uh, and I think, you know, for those 10,000 prisoners who were left behind serving excessive sentences, you know, be given freedom so that they are no longer held captive, no longer a prisoner, and become part of the fabric of our society and become whole again and regain their humanity. Now, the importance of clemency right now at, at this moment, it's so important that, <laughs> I mean, I would, I would be in prison right now had President Obama not gave me, uh, had not given me clemency. Uh, and what we've seen was that after me and the next administration, it took something, mind, uh, something to the extent to where you had to know somebody who knew somebody. If you didn't know Kim Kardashian or somebody, you just weren't going to get out. So even though I got out in 2015 and here we are 2001 and Mark was able to talk about these things that I've done, uh, would not have been able to do them uh, if President Obama had not took those steps to give up individuals like me clemency. So the power of clemency, uh, what I want to show you about the power of clemency and what it means to somebody behind bars is I, I can't tell you what it felt like to get my life back, to get that second uh, birth certificate, you could say, to be brought back from the dead. But there was an instance when I came out that they were doing a video on me and they asked me to read my executive order that the president gave me. And I hadn't read it and I hadn't read it in a while. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll, go, I'll get it and I'll read it. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share my screen with you. And I'm gonna show you the video of me where I should be able to show it. If not, you might need some help. <laughs> Not that I had it. I don't see it there. Holly, can you share? Can you share it for me? There we go. Okay. Well, uh, this is it. This is me with. Uh, uh, well, I wasn't on the wasn't on the on the show, but here is John Oliver talking about me receiving clemency and showing the video of me reading my order. Just let me know if you're not able to hear it and I can I can start again. Yeah, I wasn't able to hear it. All right, just one moment. Let me try that again for you. Look at Jason Hernandez, who was sentenced to life in prison for dealing drugs, including crack. Watch him read his commutation from the president. Be it known that I, Barack Obama, president of the United States of America, in consideration of the <laughs> other premises, there's other good. And sufficient reasons to be there on two moving. I do hereby grant the said the said application. Let me tell you just how moving that is. 
I'm moved by it, and I'm British. Am I back on, Holly? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing that video. And I mean, wow, I mean, just to see that again, uh, to, every time I see it, right? And not just to mention to, to when I received clemency, just two days ago, I had my, my supervised release, eight year supervised release that I served six and a half years on, um, uh, terminated by my federal judge. So now just to kind of almost say a next step to freedom, but I am also going to, going to apply for a pardon from the Biden administration. So the urgency of now, right? I knew, I knew that this time would come again. And I do believe that the Biden administration will do something similar to what President Obama did, if not greater. And knowing that that would come, but then knowing all the problems that were happening inside prison and outside of prison, I created a guidebook for this specific instance right here so that those people that are incarcerated wouldn't have to rely on some type of uh, superstar or some type of organization to come help them, that they could do it themselves. Because last time when they waited for everybody else, waited for the Obama administration to, uh, to help them, that we resulted in 10,000 people or close there too that stayed in prison and that are still in there right now. People who had 20 years have 30 years, have been in their 30 years now. Those who have been in their 30 years have been in their 40 years now. So I know what, the, I mean, I know what that feels like when nobody wants to help you. I remember when I was uh, reaching out to people and nobody wanted to give, nobody wanted to, to lend a hand to me. And I said, if I'm going to do everything I possibly can to empower those people that are incarcerated, to empower their families, to make, to not let nobody tell them that they don't deserve a chance, that to show people that they deserve a second chance. So I think we can't sit back right now and wait for the Biden administration to come out with the criteria, to come out with, with whatever their initiative is going to be, that we need to set the initiative. We're the experts. We need to tell them what they need to do. And I feel that if we don't do that, that there's going to, those same 10,000 prisoners or they're close to are going to be, uh, unfortunately left behind again. Uh, just, that's what, Mark, that's what I have to say about everything that's going on right now. Okay, that's that's great, Jason. And just real quickly, could you tell people how to get your book about Get Clemency Now? I'm sure there's some people who are listening to this and would like to download it or, or order it. Yeah, so you can actually go to the website, getclemencynow.org. You can view it for free, you can download it for free and you can print it for free. That was the whole tent and, and design for this book to be not only for people that are incarcerated and their families, but to law students, attorneys, everybody, so that they can be prepared for this time that when it comes so that there are no excuses. You can buy it as well on Amazon, uh, but it's you, there's really no need to. Okay, thanks so much. And, and thanks for that, that incredible resource that it was very moving to watch that video. I can tell you, I've been to the homes of a number of people who've received clemency from President Obama. And invariably, they have that letter framed on the wall. And I it chokes me up whenever I see it, because part of what President Obama said in that letter is, I'm counting on you now, that, you know, for the legitimacy of this project, you know, I'm, I'm counting on you to to, to do well in freedom as you have, Jason, that, you know, that, that uh, ask that he made of you, you fulfilled. Um, and it's a, a remarkable thing from the most powerful person in the world to, to reach out to you and, and ask for that. Um, all right. So next we're going to turn things over to Pramil Daria. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thanks for having me here today. I'm really thrilled to be um, in conversation with such esteemed co-panelists. Um, and I found all of your remarks so powerful. And Jason, I want to just echo that about the video. I was choking up over here. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I wanted to just zoom out a little bit and address some of the kind of broader policy considerations that are important here um, and about what makes clemency so important in context. Um, so first, kind of looking broadly at the Biden administration thus far, when it comes to addressing the dire need to decarcerate our country and to change policy to address the structures that have created mass incarceration, which by the way, President Biden, you know, has told us that matters to him, has told us he cares about this issue, about, about addressing the, the harms of mass incarceration. Um, you know, as Rachel noted, the administration's action on clemency thus far has been 
disheartening. It's worrisome. Uh, the slide with the fire all around and uh, everything is fine um, sort of captures it perfectly. Um, and hopefully there will be a shift to listening to experts like the three um, other people on the screen who have concrete proposals and ideas to change the game. As Jason said, you know, these are the experts. This is who should be calling the shots on, on what happens next. Um, despite his campaign promises, the administration has thus far done very little to engender hope in meaningful criminal re legal reform sort of more broadly. The federal prison population has been rising um, and that's happening in a deadly pandemic. Over 43,000 people incarcerated in federal prisons have tested positive for COVID. Um, the recent recommendation also to make permanent the class-wide scheduling of fentanyl analogs is troubling and it flies in the face of science and public health. These are some of the examples of, of sort of ongoing disappointments um, that, that matter in context here, right? When we're talking about clemency and why it's so important. Um, and so while I do want to express gratitude at some of the some of the things that the Biden administration thus far has done well, for example, uh, the meaningful increase in the number of former public defenders and civil rights lawyers being nominated to the federal bench, which is we can't understate the importance of that. It's important for us as a community to be pushing for accountability um, for the promises that the president made to us and to our communities because we deserve to see them happen. And there's tremendous power in the president's actions because real people's lives are implicated, of course, and real policies are implicated, but also because he sets the tone for the DOJ in his administration, right? And the DOJ is home to all of the federal prosecutors in the country. And so his words, his choices, his actions matter. They matter on a very, very fundamental level in courthouses across the country, not just in the White House. So when it comes to clemency, I also want to highlight one thing that I'm not sure that Rachel mentioned that I'm not sure is always apparent to those who aren't in the weeds of federal prison practices. There are very few, if close to zero, ways to get out of prison early once you're in there, um, or at all if you have a long sentence. It's not as if there are 100 mechanisms from which to pick, and oh, clemency is one possible path among the many available. That's not how our system is built it's nearly impossible to get any official of any kind to consider a request for a reduced sentence or an early release, no matter the circumstances and no matter how you got that sentence to begin with. So for those interested in the systems of mass incarceration and mass criminalization that we've built, this is really important as background for the conversation on why clemency matters so much. Decades of harsh and lengthy sentences being handed out left and right have left us with prisons full of people who have no release in sight many of whom are aging and whose underlying conduct is years in the rearview mirror. People serving long sentences are in some ways actually what makes us the world leader in incarcerating people. In federal prisons, 53% of people are serving sentences of 10 years or more. 30% are serving sentences of 15 years or more. And while it's important to think about ways to stop the flow of people into prisons, which many people do, and certainly many people in this audience I'm sure do, it's imperative that we also focus on getting people out of them. Uh, there are some useful statistics from the sentencing projects that I think are helpful to mention here. More people are sentenced to life in prison in America than there were people in prison serving any sentence in 1970. Nearly five times the number of people are now serving life sentences in the United States as were in 1984, a rate of growth that has outpaced even the sharp expansion of the overall prison population during that period. More than two thirds of those serving life sentences are people of color. One out of every seven people in prison is serving a life sentence, and one in five black men in prison is serving a life sentence. And unlike in state systems, this is, this is a critical sort of distinction between the state systems and the federal system, unlike in state systems, almost half of the people in federal prison are there for drug offenses, which is an area that President Biden promised to make a priority, recognizing decades of harmful approaches to drug policy and utilizing the tools that are available to him to actually make a change. And federal clemency could not be more central to that promise. Compassionate release is the other way that people in federal prison have to seek early release. Rachel touched on this earlier as well, but compassionate release requires a showing of extraordinary and compelling reasons. And while that should, of course, also be an avenue for release, it's limited and it faces significant backlogs of its own. Rachel described the faulty architecture of the current clemency process in her remarks, and I hope that there's time for her and or Mark to, to dig in a little bit more on that because they have really excellent proposals for paths forward and some of the reasons why the current system doesn't make any sense. 
Um, but I want to also highlight another reason those ideas and clemency itself is so important. The incarceration of the 150,000 plus people in federal prisons today is itself based on the structural injustice of our criminal legal system, right? These issues, when taken piecemeal, often result in widespread agreement. I mean, in fact, you know, President Biden campaigned on a number of these piecemeal issues that undergird how these people ended up in prison to begin with. We have racially disparate and unjust policing and sentencing policies, right? Not a controversial statement. People agree about this. People want to do something about this. Pretrial detention is harmful and can be coercive. Again, not controversial. Mandatory minimums are unfair and should be undone. President Biden talked about this in his campaign and on his website. This is, again, a commonly understood truth. Prosecutors hide evidence at times and sometimes use coercive tactics to ensure guilty pleas. Again, this is widely understood, by, especially by people who practice in courts, um, like as I did as a public defender. Another is that we set people up for reincarceration through our onerous system of so-called supervision and surveillance, right? That is often the case as well. So people agree on many of these piecemeal underlying factors, um, the harms of our current criminal legal system. But doing something about these issues means tackling the system from various directions, right? It means taking a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to addressing them. It means acknowledging that these structural and policy problems must be considered when we're talking about the importance of release mechanisms like clemency. They are the reasons that our prisons are full of human beings. In addition to making front end policy changes, we need to be finding ways to bring people home. And we have one really clear way, clemency. We need President Biden to make it meaningful and to use it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, very worthwhile to get that that um, bigger frame of, of what we're talking about. Um, again, if anyone has questions who's uh, tuning in, you can go to the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A button and type in your question for us. I do want to follow up with um, Professor Barco on something. And that is, um, you know, there's people certainly who say Professor that uh, President Biden uh, doesn't really have to act because on the one hand, there's things like compassionate release that can let people out, or he should wait until legislation cleans it up. And what do you say to those people? They're fools. <laughs> um, so here's what I would say uh, is that was what President Obama thought, you know, if for those of us who are working in the trenches on clemency during the Obama administration, you know, now is when we're getting our PTSD because um, every time you would urge them to do something bigger and bolder, they were worried that that wasn't appropriate because really this was something that required a big legislative fix. They, they weren't sure that was the right appropriate role for clemency. And they were worried that that might undercut the momentum to get legislative change. So they were kind of walking this tightrope. Um, and, and I guess I want to point out two lessons that I hope are learned from that experience. So one is you know, the Obama people were, were holding out hope for this legislative fix. And ultimately, what came about through legislation was the First Step Act. And I think the critical thing to note about that is it had no retroactive sentencing relief for anyone other than people who were serving crack sentences under that old uh, 100 to 1 ratio. So, you know, about 4,000 people finally got the ability to get retroactive sentencing relief for crack after more than three decades, I will just say. So, if the legislative fix model you have in mind is a three decade lag time to fix a problem that had been obvious for that long, you're, you're not going to get a legislative fix for the people who are currently incarcerated right now. Congress seems to have no appetite for retroactive sentencing adjustments. So, so kind of the first issue I would say is even if you could get Congress to act, we've seen no indication they're going to act in that way. And so clemency is the urgent mechanism for dealing with that precise problem. Similarly, there is no indication that there's legislative appetite to deal with the pardon function either for any kind of expungement for eliminating, for example, collateral consequences that people face in terms of benefits reductions, the you know, threat of deportation, all those things. So I don't see any of that on the horizon. Um, and the other kind of lesson, I guess I would say is, you know, the Obama administration also kind of thought, well, we just kind of need to get the ball rolling and then our successor will kind of take over. Um, 
Now, I think they thought the successor was going to be a different person <laughs> um, than, the, than the one that they got. But that's a lesson, too. Um, you can't rely on people and the discretion of individuals to fix things. This is a structural and a process problem. And so if you care about these issues, you need to fix the structure and the process. And it's not enough to kind of rely on who's coming down to follow you next. Um, and it's not enough to rely on legislation. It, there's, there's no sign that that's happening. Um, um, and it's the president's constitutional responsibility to engage in just that kind of error correction on individual sentences and, you know, could do it on a categorical basis. You know, the president could certainly say all of those changes should have been retroactive because they should have. Um, and I, I'll add a lot of the mandatory minimum changes that had been made in the First Step Act, reducing some of the mandatory minimums, were adjusting mandatory minimums that Joe Biden personally uh, had pushed for in his time in the Senate. And so there's another twist to this story that I do think is worth mentioning. I don't know that we'll ever have another president so uniquely responsible for the, the specific people um, who are seeking relief. Um, and so, you know, I had sort of held out hope that this was going to be a redemption story, not just for the people who filed petitions, but, you know, for President Biden himself. You know, what an amazing opportunity to right some wrongs and show that he had learned some lessons, which he had told us all he had learned, uh, as Pramal pointed out on the campaign trail. You know, he had said, wow, I, I really get this now. I see things totally differently. Well, you know, all you got to do is, as President Obama famously said, I, I got a pen. Um, and, and he could use that pen and he could right those, those wrongs that he himself was part of. Thank you. And Jason, I want to circle back to you. And I know that people reach out to you who are in prison um, and who are seeking clemency. What's your sense of, uh, you know, there's, there's times that people are optimistic, times that they're less optimistic. Is there a sense of disappointment right now? Or what are you sensing? Oh, I think you're on mute. I, I wouldn't say dis disappointed. Uh, there is Again, when I was incarcerated, when President Obama was, was was elected, I mean, when he was elected, it was like the Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. Like people, we were banging on walls and windows and cheering. I mean, it was this big roar because we felt that something's going to happen, uh, even though nothing happened the next four, the, the four years he was there until the fifth year he was in office. I do feel the increase of emails that I'm getting from people that are incarcerated has, you know, tripled. Uh, I get way more emails that I do now than I do through the Trump administration when he was in office. So they are asking what's what's happening, what's going on, what, what are you hearing, who's going to be eligible for it. Uh, so again, I think that there's that they're optimistic that something's going to be put into place here soon. Uh, you know, I think one of the main things that's being asked is, are they going to? What about uh, crimes outside of outside of drug? drug crimes, because I think if I'm not mistaken, President Obama granted clemency only to all drug offenders. There wasn't one person outside of that category that received clemency, people that committed fraud, uh, but then also those that committed violent crimes as well. You have those individuals who have, who are incarcerated, who have been in there 20, 30 years that are saying, you know, I committed my crime when I was in my teens or in my, when, when I was in their twenties and that they're not that boy no more, that they're now an old man and that they would like to have a chance as well, not to just be categorically denied, right? Like to consider all the, the petitions, not just certain ones. And I think that's, a, that's not a, something a hard to ask. That's not a hard question to ask. I think that as, as Rachel said, the pen, right? The power of the pen. I know the power of the pen because I wrote President Obama a letter asking him to release me. But I think mass clemency, how you end mass incarceration, you do it through mass clemency, and what does that involve? The signature, right? It was a signature by the president that put us in there and a signature by the president that could get us out of there. So, you know, the, the pen, right? There's nothing more power, powerful than the sword, the, the sword of what I say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. So, um, Pramal, I want to return to you for a second. Um, you mentioned that there's been some things that the Biden administration has done that's been encouraging so far, but there's others that have been disappointing. Um, given that we saw an administration that brought in some people who had been activists within the, this, this realm, um, why do you think there's been uh, such a slow walk at the start of this administration on some of these important things? <laughs> 
great question. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, Rachel's book um, answers a lot of that for us, right? We're stuck um, in politics and media narratives and sort of historical narratives that get reinforced about what our criminal legal system is meant to do and what it actually does. Um, the, the sort of farce that is connected to public safety. Um, so I think that that's part of it. Um, I, you know, I think that, like I said before, to its credit, the administration has has um, focused heartily on federal judicial nominations, and I think that's really important. Um, and you know, I'm I'm heartened to see the changes already coming on the federal bench. Um, and so I think a lot of attention has gone to that. But I think that I mean, it's it's inexcusable, frankly. Um, as Rachel said earlier, and as Jason has mentioned. I mean, these are these are real human beings. You know, in addition to the people who are currently incarcerated, we now have this threat of reincarceration hanging over numerous people's heads who, who are released under the CARES Act. I mean, it's it's cruel what we're what we're doing to people. Um, and and the fact that there is an opportunity to uh, address that cruelty right away, quickly, um, and with clarity, and that it's not being utilized is completely unfathomable, to be honest. Hey, Mark, can I jump in on some um, one of the, you know, so so I agree, we don't know for sure um, why we're not seeing more, but, um, you know, reading some tea leaves, I think one thing that's happening now perversely is because during the Trump administration, there was such an abuse of the president's uh, relationship with the Department of Justice, so much interference with things the president shouldn't have been interfering with, um, such a disregard for the department's traditional role, um, such politicization and cronyism in the granting of clemency. I fear that part of what we're seeing now is a reaction specifically to Trump without going back on a further timeline and also stopping to ask, you know, not just fixing what Trump did, but also thinking about fixing some of the problems during the Obama administration. And, and I think they may have overcorrected uh, to the point of saying, wow, we're just, we love the Department of Justice. You know, unlike Trump, you know, the Department of Justice, we are, we're going to let them do what they do. And, and we don't want to even remotely look like we're interfering with them. And, and I think there may be a concern that, you know, somehow changing the operation of clemency would look too much like what Trump was doing. Now, I think that is such a crazy takeaway from the Trump administration, right? To not be Trump, you just don't give clemency ad hoc to your criminal co-conspirators. Um, you know, it's a pretty low bar and it doesn't mean that what you can't do is fix structural problems with the dispensation of clemency itself. And, you know, anyone that I have ever had a conversation with about the way federal clemency works. As soon as I say, yes, the prosecutors who brought the case are in charge. <laughs> you know, people pretty much get the fox guarding the hen house problem there right off the bat. And then, you know, the follow-up question is usually, is that typical? Is that like a thing? And then I say, no, no state does that, that no other jurisdiction does that. So we have this really odd historical accident that put federal prosecutors in charge that's been crying out to be fixed that almost every Democratic presidential candidate for president said, I will fix that when I get there. Um, that then President Biden did not say that when he was a candidate, but he did adopt um, in the Biden Sanator, Sanders Unity Task Force document said, oh, you know, when I look at the things that um, Senator Sanders said he was going to do and they tried to kind of reach agreement, um, that was one of them. So this idea of fixing clemency, taking it out of the Department of Justice, making sure it was functioning was something that was just a consensus idea that had been adopted. And I think somehow it has gotten entangled with this broader narrative about somehow not getting on DOJ's turf that I'm, I worry about that that might be part of it. In addition to all the other things that Premal was saying, I think are also true, but I think there may be a little side story here uh, that worries me. Yeah, and I, I note that Rachel and I have written about the problems with DOJ pretty extensively. I think in the last year, it's been the Washington Post, New York Times, and most recently in Inquest, um, we did a piece there. Uh, so we have a question from a uh, particularly informed viewer here asking, there are indications that President Biden will be granting commutations to individuals who are released pursuant to the CARES Act, um, that is home confinement, who face the prospect of return to prison after the pandemic. How do you think that will figure into President Biden's overall clemency approach. 
Rachel, do you want to go first on that one? Sure. So um, my understanding is that um, the administration has indicated that it is considering clemency for a subset of the people who are currently out on home confinement. Um, and in particular, that subset is um, a group of people who I believe have more than 18 months left to serve on their sentence and fall into a category of nonviolent drug offender. So it's a it's a, I, I don't know what the exact number would be of the people. There's about 4,000 people, I think, on home confinement right now. And that subset would probably be more in the neighborhood of like a thousand of those people. Um, so, you know, all off the bat, we're talking about three quarters of them have not been contacted or told that they're in the ballpark of having been considered for this. Um, and then of the ones who are, um, they're supposed to file a clemency petition like you know, everybody else. So I presumably think <laughs> somehow their petition is not going to get in line behind the other 16,000 that are already there and they're going to do something to keep track of them. Um, but they still have to go through the normal Department of Justice. My understanding is the normal Department of Justice process. Um, so, you know, just to flag a few things that are wrong with that. If you can't grant categorical clemency to a group of people who have already been pre-screened by Attorney General Bill Barr as not presenting a risk to their community, who have been out and living productive, safe lives, and you can't, with the stroke of your pen, give all of those people clemency right off the bat, that's your first giant red flag that we have a serious problem with the administration. I, I think they are the easiest group to categorically, you keep them out, we're in the middle of a pandemic, it's just insane to me that you need anything more from those folks. So the fact they're carving out just a subset of them that they're thinking about maybe giving clemency to, um, I think is it's it's inexplicable. Um, I do think that, you know, a concern I've heard some people raise, and I do not know that this is the administration's concern, this is just conjecture on the part of some, is I think the group of people that uh, were released for CARES Act um, home confinement is as a disproportionately wider group of people than what looks like the overall prison population. So there may be a concern that, you know, if you kind of target that group, you're not addressing some of the core racial justice issues. But of course, the solution to that is to make sure you release all the people of color who should have been released under the CARES Act. Uh, and you you expand the pool, you don't arbitrarily send other people back. Um, but that that's my understanding of where things currently are. And I'll just add on that. My great fear is that somehow they give clemency to this quarter of the CARES Act people. And then they, you know, put out their White House press release that says President Biden historically grants clemency to a thousand people in his first term. Never before have we seen a president give, you know, this kind of clemency. And they try to kind of rah-rah, this is a big deal. Um, when, you know, that's like a rah-rah big deal, like I woke up this morning and went to work. Right, like I did, um, but I was supposed to do that. It was kind of the bare minimum. Um, so I don't think that would be something that should be applauded. Uh, it should be, frankly, all of them should get it. Uh, and, and we should be releasing far more people under the CARES Act who are still in there who are inexplicably denied as well. Um, Jason or Pramil, do you have anything on that, that on the CARES Act? I was just gonna, oh, sorry, Jason, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to sort of like pile on to the last point that Rachel made, which was my biggest fear, which is that it, this like tiny carve out, um, which is in itself is harmful, right? Like carving out some subset of a group of people who all deserve it um, and saying some are deserving and some are undeserving reinforces bigger structural problems that we're going to have to contend with for years to come in all parts of criminal legal reform. Um, so it's, it's, you know, a queer creating new harm um, to do that kind of carve out. Um, and, and on top of that, I, my biggest fear is that it creates political cover for not doing anything else um, in, the, in the months to come um, when big structural change is needed and far more release is needed. Um, and so, so that's, that's really my biggest fear. Yeah, Jason? Yeah, I, I would just say that we know who, petitions have been filed back since 2011 and even now with those who met this criteria for uh, the, the Obama administration, which we, Biden had to work hand in hand with that because they're like brothers, right? I mean, they do, do everything together. And that is not hard. I, I don't see what the problem is as far as these individuals under the CARES Act that why can't you release them? 
through an administration, through the Trump administration, which have basically has released them as well. Uh, again, I, I just don't, I don't understand, I don't get it. I don't understand what, what the hold of it is. There should be something in place already. Yeah. So we got a question here that uh, I'll, I'll answer a little bit and then throw it over to the others. And it's from Queen Karen Garrison. Uh, who in this administration is most educated and effectively active when it comes to clemency and commutation at the time? Um, which of you are working with them? And that's a great question, because one thing that I think we've learned over the past couple of administrations is that it makes a huge difference if there's a top advisor who's really motivated on this. I think the sense was that in the Obama administration, the president himself was motivated, but also Valerie Jarrett, somebody that they looked to for advice who, who pushed for change. Within the Trump administration, we did get the First Step Act, and it was Jared Kushner who was the advocate within the Trump administration for that kind of change. What hasn't emerged from what I've seen in this administration is that person, that person who has access to the president, who has the president's ear, who's going to be able to keep this something like the reforms we're talking about on the agenda um, and up at the top. Um, certainly, the White House counsel plays a role. The, um, the Domestic Policy Council plays a role. And there's a, a group of people within the White House Counsel's Office who have made a point of reaching out to people who are involved in, on, on this, these issues and, and have heard um, you know, a lot of what we're saying today. Um, what's not clear is, is who it might be that's really going to, uh, <laughs> you know, in those informal moments, say to the president, this matters, this needs to change. So do others have thoughts on that? No? Okay. Well, I, I do want to throw out another question, and that is um, the, uh, you know, what's the most important thing that President Biden could do right now um, in this area? What is it that, that uh, you know, if he's, if he's going to make a move, what, what should that move be? And um, I'll, I'll start with you, Promo. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was just looking at the questions, I think, which all sort of go to like, what next, right? Like, what can yeah. we do? And I think, I mean, there's so many mechanisms and I, you and Rachel really have put forth a number of proposals in various pieces of writing, as you mentioned, um, you know, and I think first and foremost is this big structural change that needs to happen, which is getting this process out of the Department of Justice, um, right? And so, I mean, I think that that's, that, that leads to all of the other changes that could happen. And I don't think we can get to other legislative fixes or you know other sort of potential opening up new mechanisms, which I think is also important, right? So I can look at legislation. There's there's all kinds of things that could be added to the mix, but I don't think we're gonna see success in any of them until we take this initial fundamental step of removing prosecutors from the decision making, you know, component of this process. Yeah. And um I think I could certainly understand that, uh, you know, as a former prosecutor, the commitment you have to being right is huge. You, you've been a few feet away from someone as you're arguing for years of their life, sometimes their entire life to be taken away from them. Um, the moral costs of being wrong or having that change are huge. And I think that, uh, of course, you're going to run into problems and that's the, the line of decision. Jason, do you have any thoughts on that? On what oh, Biden should do, the most important yeah. thing, uh, set a policy initiative and uh, a clemency policy initiative and set it quick. Those were the exact same words President, President Bush, Bush told President Obama in his last two or three hours of, of, of his presidency. They talked about probably a thousand things, but one of the things which I, I wish I could have been in the been in the limousine at that time yeah. to think about that that the last things that president bush was thinking about to advise president obama was that he should focus on clemency on pardons clemency and set a policy and set it quick out of all this out of all the wrong things that were going on in the united states at that time president obama, obama didn't do it uh so we know that biden knows this right he knows that th that this is important this extraordinary uh this godlike power <laughs> to bring people back from the, like this is an extraordinary power that this president has right mm -hmm. and if, even even in the uh, in shit like say for example in schindler's list right i think it was schindler he, when he told him on the true power is not letting somebody brought in prison right or sending somebody to prison 
True power is showing mercy, forgiveness, that that is what power is. And not everybody can do that. So here, President Biden has that opportunity to, to again, to, to, to show people what true power is and what it should be. Yeah, exactly. Um, Rachel, what do you think is the most important thing Biden should do? Well, I agree with uh, what uh, both Pramal and Jason have said already. Um, and I guess just to add a little more detail to it. So, you know, I think the policy should be there's an emergency 16,000 petition backlog and I need to sign an executive order tomorrow creating an emergency commission that's gonna help me churn through the backlog. You don't even have to remove things from DOJ permanently, but at a minimum you should do what President Ford did with his big backlog of people who were the Vietnam draft evaders um, is you recognize special circumstances call sometimes for special presidential action. So the first thing I would tell him to do is deal with this emergency first, um, have a special commission set up that it helps you churn through your backlog. Um, I'd probably set up either the same commission or two and have another one that does the CARES Act folks. Now the CARES Act folks, honestly, I don't think you need a commission. I think you need the pen um, and you just give them all, you give them all clemency because um, if they had done anything wrong, you would know about it because they would have already been sent set back. So, you know, really what I think um, should happen is that. And then the, the set after he does that, the second thing is you need to start using your bully pulpit to talk about these issues. There's a deafening silence out of the White House on pretty much everything related to criminal law and justice. Have you heard them talk about any of the major pieces of legislation that, you know, people are fighting to get through in Congress? Because I, I haven't, you know, I haven't heard of a big push uh, to, to deal with some of the things that we're seeing in terms of equalizing, for example, crack and powder cocaine. So the ratios are exactly the same now, which should be an absolute no brainer. Um, seeing them push forward other legislative changes to, to the kind of the second step kind of things that come after the first step act. Um, they're not even trying to move stuff through Congress. They're just weirdly quiet on the criminal justice front. And I fear it's, it's, it's what Premel was talking about before. I fear there's a little bit of um, a concern that they're going to get tied up in an unpopular abolish the police kind of movement or frame, and they don't want to kind of come anywhere near that, um, which I view as just complete and total political cowardice, because um, you can get in front of these issues. It's your obligation as, a, as the president to explain some of these things to people, to explain what real public safety looks like, um, and you can be leading on all of it. So, so for me, it would be you deal with the emergency back you get clemency put into an advisory body that you, the president, hear from directly and help you deal with that when you give them a directive of who you're interested in. Uh, Jason's point about, you know, you pick your policy, you get people in there to help you do it. Um, but you also show leadership on these issues and, and you find yourself out there being heard on it. And I know there's a million things. <laughs> it's a pandemic. We have everything going on in Afghanistan. Like it's it's a lot, um, but but this is a lot too. Um, and this is a really important issue. And this is a person who was elected and, and gave a pledge and a promise that he would not turn his back on racial justice issues. Um, it was a big part of what got him into office. It was a big part of what he pledged right away in his, uh, his very first speech when he uh, accepted the presidency that he was not gonna turn his back on these issues. And if you care about racial justice, you cannot ignore what we're talking about with, with the criminal legal punishment bureaucracy that he is overseeing. This, this should be priority one. And it's the easiest one for him to address when it comes to clemency because he doesn't need anybody else's help. Yeah, absolutely. So stay off mute for a second, uh, Rachel, because we got a question from Professor Mona Lynch. Uh, to Professor Barco's point on prosecutors guarding the hen house, the worst, most aggressive prosecutors who produce the worst injustices are least likely to support clemency. Can you foresee some kind of proactive internal DOJ program to more closely examine cases from those districts where sentences were the most draconian? Uh, it's a great point. Um, and I wish I could say that I was optimistic that DOJ could kind of clean its own house that way. <laughs> um, that was not my experience. Um, for example, when I was on the sentencing commission, we would have representatives from DOJ come in and complain about all the judicial disparity that they had seen. How can you have a judge and you know one district do X and another district do Y? And I can't tell you how many times my colleagues and I would say, you know, we're noticing similar patterns among your prosecutors <laughs> that, you know, there's really big disparities in how you're filing, for example, 851 enhancements, people getting double mandatory minimums. Uh, that is huge variation by district. So U.S. attorneys taking wildly different approaches. Um, 
And there was no effort by the department to do anything to kind of equalize or address that. You know, they have some vague centralized memos that go out uh, and there's, a, it's not called the U.S. Attorney's Manual anymore. What is it? The Justice Manual. They have some new name for it that I can't quite remember what it is, but you know, the, what was formerly known as the U.S. Attorney's Manual. They have that plus some memos that are supposed to be the kind of equalizing documents, but they are woefully inadequate to the task. And so you do actually have, um, and, and I know actually no one knows this more than Mona. So, <laughs> so I'm definitely saying something that no one has studied more effectively and well than her. Um, you have these wide disparities. I don't think that the department is really positioned well to address them in-house. I think they kind of let the different districts do their thing. Um, and other than the few things that you have to get pre-clearance from DOJ for, you know, certain kind of wiretaps, death penalty kind of stuff, they sort of let those other chips fall where they may. Um, that is actually why I think it's really critical to have functioning clemency, because I think it's the president's obligation to even some of that out. Um, and, and I wrote a, you know, a, I'm sure much too long law review article that I think that was actually part of the constitutional design. Like, I think if you're a unitary executive type or just a strong executive type, that's exactly what the president should use the clemency authority for, is to kind of make sure all the little districts are doing what the president wants. And so when you have the outliers that are overcharging, you use clemency precisely to fix that. But I don't think that will happen unless you have a body outside of DOJ taking a look and doing it. Uh, but it would be very easy for a body like that to do. You know, For example, that for me, that would be one of the things I would urge the president to do is start, for example, with 851 enhancements. You know, There's a really great sentencing commission report on this. You can immediately look at the districts that have gone over the top in seeking double mandatory minimums. There they're outliers, you know, you could correct those right off the bat. So there's a lot you could do with data um, and disparities that are based by on district uh, that would be great for a president to prioritize. But in order to implement that effectively, I think you have to take it out of the department. Yeah. So we've got a, um, a great question from uh, Professor Doug Berman about what can Congress do to help. But uh, <laughs> even though he's the organization, organizer of the whole symposium. I do think I want to end with Jason. And Jason, there's a lot of us who are in a situation right now where we've advocated through the Trump administration into the Biden administration where there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope maybe. And of you're the expert on hope. Somehow doing a life sentence, you kept working and you envisioned your freedom. Um, how did you maintain hope through that period? Well, Unfortunately, it took my brother, uh, who was murdered in prison, serving 30 years for four grams of crack cocaine, for me to change my life around. Uh, but with that, right, what I, have I spoke about earlier, I had, I had hope, right? A lot of hope, faith that I was going to get out. I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to, I lived every day like I was going to get out after that because I knew it was going to happen. But one of my main reasons for coming out, when I talked about earlier about neighborhoods looking like atomic bombs had been dropped on, My neighborhood, where I grew up at, looks like that to an extent, for certain parts of it. I contributed to that by the stuff that I did. I was selling drugs in my community. And I have to live with that, even now to this day, right? It bothers me, right? It hurts. I got to go through my neighborhood and I see stuff that I did back in when I was a kid, 18, 19, 20 years old, that still has an impact on that community. That there's still people incarcerated by stuff that acts that I did, and I wanted to get out. That's what made, that's what kept that hope that I want to come back to this community and make a difference. Uh, and I have, right? I, 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 and I'm never going to stop. I owe a debt to this community. But you know what? I ain't the only one who created what happened here and what happened across thousands of black and brown communities across the United States. And it just wasn't the drug dealers, right? As I mentioned earlier, that the cure was worse than the poison. And those individuals that were up on top, who didn't give us in our communities what we needed, better schools, simple things like sidewalks, uh, lampposts, so we could see at night, right? The small things that we needed that we didn't get, but we got more officers, right? We, we didn't get treatment. There was no such thing as rehabilitation. That those individuals up there now who contributed to that, and one's in the most powerful man in the world right now, that he has that ability to make up for all the wrong that was committed back then. And I know it's hard for me to sleep at night for what I did. And I don't see how anybody else can, but 
if you're in a position to make change, to whom, how they say, to whom much is given, much is expected, right? That this is how America can make right. Mass clemency. I think that's a pretty good place to end. Um, I'd really like to thank the, the panelists um, and thank everybody who tuned in for this discussion. I, I hope you found it as worthwhile as, as I did. Thank you.